evening, depending on which part of the world you are turning into this uh, webinar, webinar. On my own behalf and on behalf of the Vatican Congregation for Catholic Education, I extend my cordial greetings to the Chancellor, to all academic authorities and particularly to Bangalore University students and to all who are following this international webinar. I thank you for organizing this encounter dedicated to Pope Francis' recent encyclical letter Fratelli Tutti and for having invited me to address you. I apologize for not being able to remain to entire time that had been foreseen due to another scheduled event that is taking place at the same time at a different university. However, the Under Secretary of the Congregation, Father Frederick Bechina, is pleased to, uh, to be able to present the reflection I had prepared for this occasion. In closing, I would like to express my helpful thanks to Pope Francis for having given us such an important and rich document. Our academic institutions are directly involved and they must work to study this encyclical and present it through initiatives that uh, are aimed not only at students but also at the general public to disseminate a new vision that can help promote cultural change in all countries. It is with a sincere gratitude that I recognize that this is precisely the aim of Bangalore University's International Webinar. May God bless you all. Thank you. Fratelli Tutti is not a summary of the doctrine on fraternal love, but it highlights its universal dimension and points to a dream of fraternity and social friendship. The structure of the document and chapter titles reveal the ample scope of the issues and projects that are being addressed. I would like to emphasize a few aspects to provide you with a key to reading this encyclical letter. Fratelli Tutti develops two themes at the same time, fraternity on one hand and social friendship, which are at the core of the text and its meaning. Fraternity is not only an emotion or a feeling or an idea, but to Francis its effect that also implies going out, taking action and investing your freedom. Who should I become a brother to? Fraternity takes time, it requires time, and it demands to waste our time for others. Fraternity saves and takes up the time of politics, mediation, encounter, building civil society and care. We need to rediscover this powerful word of the gospel, taking up in the motto of the French Revolution. The post-revolutionary order then abandoned it for well-known reasons, up to the point of deleting it from the political economic lexicon. This term has been replaced by the weaker term solidarity. The Pope wrote in one of his messages, while solidarity is the principle of social planning that allows the unequal to become equal, fraternity is what allows the equal to be different people. Acknowledging fraternity change our perspective. It turns it upside down and into a strong political message. We all are brothers. Therefore, we all are citizens with equal rights and duties. And under its mantle, we all enjoy justice. 
Hence, fraternity is a solid foundation to live out the second principle highlighted by the document. This is social friendship. It is the commitment to work together to build the common good. It is an attitude that can reconcile rights and responsibilities for the common good, diversity and recognition of a radical fraternity. Among the many aspects covered by this encyclical letter, I would like to draw your attention to four key points. First point, the Pope describes the tragedies of our time and mentions five in particular. He does so through the reading that is imbued with a spirit of participation and faith and is rooted in the spirit of the gospel. This is the starting point for this theological reflection. The first element concerned politics. Today, lofty words such as democracy, freedom, justice, and unity are losing the fullness of their meaning. Themes like historical consciousness, critical thinking, struggle for justice, and the ways of integration are also becoming increasingly empty. Therefore, politics in its current this small state deserves a harsh judgment. Political life no longer has to do with healthy debates about long-term plans to improve people's lives and to advance the common good, but only with slick marketing techniques primarily aimed at discrediting others, for end of quotation. The second element, is the throwaway culture. Depleted politics favors a throwaway culture. The text continues with a reflection on human rights, respect for which is a prerequisite for a country's social and economic development. The fourth element is an important paragraph dedicated to migration. Then there is a fifth element, namely risks related to communication. With digital connections, distance becomes smaller, but attitudes of closure and intolerance thrive and fuel hate movements. A more human communication is needed. I come to the second point. A second key point is the intention to offer a path of hope to those who want to lift their spirit towards great things. In this line, Francis dedicates an entire chapter to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Listening to the word of God is a fundamental step to judge the tragedy of our time through the lens of the gospel and find solution. Thus, the Good Samaritan becomes a social and civil model. The inclusion or exclusion of the woundings on the sides of the road defines all economic, political, social, and religious projects. The Pope, in fact, does not stop at the level of individual choices, but brings these two options at the level of state policies. However, he always goes back to the personal level for fear that people might feel they have no responsibility. Third point. The third point is the dialogue of culture of encounter that the Pope discusses in chapter six. In fact, Francis summarizes some of the verbs that he used in his encyclical letter with a single word, dialogue. In a pluralistic society, writes the Holy Father, dialogue is the best way to realize what ought always to be affirmed and respected apart from any ephemeral consensus." End of quotation. In this context, the Pope evokes a particular vision of social love that is made up of a constant encounter of differences. He remarks that this is the time for a dialogue. Nowadays, we all exchange messages through social networks, but often dialogue is confused with a feverish exchange of opinions, which is really a monologue where aggressionists prevail. This is also the style that seems to hold sway in the political arena, which in turn has direct impact on people's daily lives. 
quotation, authentic social dialogue involves the ability to respect the other's point of view and to admit that it may include legitimate convictions and concerns. This is the dynamic of fraternity, its ex existential character. It helps to re relativize ideas, at least in the sense of not surrendering to the fact that the conflict arising from a disparity of views and opinions will definitely prevail over fraternity. Dialogue does not mean relativism, but the patient search for the highest values that always come first. Encounter and dialogue thus become a culture of encounter, which corresponds to the passion of a people that wants to plan something that involves everyone. This is not the good in itself, but a way of pursuing the common good. Fourth and last point. The last part of the encyclical is dedicated to religions and their role in the service of fraternity. Religions are a repository of centuries of experience and wisdom. Therefore, they must participate in public debate, just like politics or science. For this reason, the church does not restrict her mission to the private sphere. It is true that the Pope points out that religious ministers must not engage in the party politics that are the proper domain of the laity, but neither can they renounce the political dimension of life itself." End of quotation. The church therefore has a public role that also pursues universal fraternity. Dear professors, students of this meritorious university, with this new encyclical letter, Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis is presenting us with a document that summarizes the may, many teachings of the magisterium of the church. He invites us to believe and to live by them through projects that promote the culture of encounter and fraternity, both at the academic level as well as in ecclesial and social practice, always in dialogue with our contemporary world. In this, it is this therefore appropriate that ecclesiastical faculties and Catholic universities make this effort in their study and research work with the aim of training qualified individuals in the various fields of pastoral life as well as in those of culture and society. It seems only natural to think the contents of this encyclical letter with the indications provided in the foreword of the Constitu Apostolic Constitution Veritatis Gaudium regarding ecclesiastical universities and faculties. In discussing the specific task of academic institutions, the pontiff invites them to educate their students to look beyond the confines of their diocese, nation, or right, and to be able to meet the needs of the whole church ready in their soul to preach the gospel everywhere. After citing the social encyclicals of the post-council period, he exalts academic institutions to expand reason through study so that students are able to know and direct the new and daunting dynamics that trouble the human family by enriching them from the perspective of the civilization of love whose seed God has planted in every people and in every culture. I wish you all the best for this meeting and for your academic work in this new